Okay. So first of all, I am an atheist. I am an atheist. And I'm saying this because since that that interview, a lot of people have been trying to convince me that I'm not an atheist. <laughs> I'm supposedly just a naturalist. Because I believe, I, I only look for evidence, and that's why I don't believe in God. So I'm just a naturalist. And I also will change my mind if provided with scientific arguments and uh, rational arguments. I will change my mind, like Richard Dawkins, who is also an agnostic. So I'm just an agnostic. But I'm saying here that I am an atheist. And that, thank you, thank you. And I'm coming out to you guys, which is really very special. And I'm coming out in front of Dan Barker, which is also very special because the way I came out to my family as an atheist was through Dan Barker. He didn't visit the Philippines and then I said, hey, <laughs> and that didn't happen. But what I did was, of course, um, all of us here in the Philippines receive all of those chain letters saying that, if you don't send this religious message, Jesus will be sad. <laughs> or, or something bad will happen, right? Like, I get tons of those in my family mailing list. So it's, it's been like a chain mailing list. And what I did to counter that, or at least to balance that, is to post one of Dan Barker's articles about why Jesus was being a jerk. So I, so I posted that there in that very religious family, and of course, they reacted, don't listen to that guy, he's just wasting his time. Because he's nothing but an atheist. And then I said, so am I. And then, and then all hell broke loose. So thank you. Wow, wow. This is so special. Thank you, Patas. Thank you, M, John. All of you, this has been a very special day. I come full circle. I'm an atheist. This is true. This is true. Now, I'm also a fan, not only of Dan Barker and all of these other guys, but the work they do. And more than promoting the idea of atheism, they also promote se separation of church and state. And people often mention all of these horsemen, like, of course, Hitchens and, and Harris and Dawkins and Dennett, but I actually think that what Dan Barker is doing, like filing lawsuits, and getting the job done is very important as well, although it's not getting much recognition. And that is why when I was inspired by what he did in what we do at the Filipino Free Thinkers, which is fight for secularism. You're not a group of ex that's exclusively atheists. What I usually say is that we do not promote atheism per se, we promote a society that would allow atheism to thrive. Now that's a different thing. So. Reason, science, and secularism are our values. That's what we have in common. And a while ago, Dan mentioned that we were kind of turning a corner. And we were at this time where there's kind of a shift in the way the world works. Now, some people from the World Value Survey, namely Inglehart and Wellsell, so they studied how people change the way they think from decades for decades. And they sampled like 80% of the world. And what they found is some good news. The good news is we're all headed towards that direction, the upper right. More choice, more freedom. From a, uh, an origin that's very constrained, okay? And the good news for the Philippines is that our self-expression values are very high. This is reflected by how we can differ from the Catholic bishops when we make choices about contraception. What, how we accept LGBT people, how our gender gap is very, very small. Some of the best in the world are ratings for the gender gap. Even better than the US, actually, which is very surprising because we do not have a reproductive health bill yet. Now, why is that? Because it's not just self-expression values that you need, according to these guys from the World Value Survey. You also need secular, rational values. And that, I'm afraid, is what we're lacking in. Now, my talk today will be about why that is. Why is it that our secular rational values are so low in spite of having such high self-expression values? Now one thing that the World Value Survey guys uh, taught is that, that works already? Yeah. Okay, thank you. This guy, I'm sure, appreciated that exercise. 
<laughs> well, not really. I was walking around the back searching for. Uh, really, really now. Okay. <laughs> now, anyway. Now they taught us that secular rational values are not something that that's neutral. They actually have a benefit for society. It's more freedom, more democracy, more effective democracy, and that's what my talk will be about. Now, the common understanding of secularism is simply separation of church and state, or what refers to this world only. Now, the person who actually coined secularism, uh, George Jacob Holyoke, had a different idea. It was much more than just separation of church and state. He said that there are three levels of secularism that we must go through as, as secularists. The first level is fighting for freedom of expression, because during his time, that wasn't really a given. So you had to fight for freedom of expression, believe that no idea was, could be censored. Next was free thought, was the second thing. Once you had freedom of expression and you exercised it, you must exercise it to criticize religion, to become a free thinker and promote the values that are antithetical to dogma, tradition, and authority of religion. Now, once you criticize them, and this is something Norm touched on a while ago, is that you can't just break stuff down. You have to build it up as well. You have to provide something to replace it with. As people changing habits have realized, it's easier to change your habit when you have something to replace it with. And according to George Jacob Holyoke, that thing is secularism. I mean, humanism, or a more active way of promoting the ideas of free thought. It's like taking the consequences of free thought seriously. And that's what he's talking about. Of course, George Jacob Holyoke was not just a theorizer. He wasn't just someone who coined terms such as secularism or jingoism. I think it was also him. He also was part of the British secularism movement. Now, the British secularism movement also advocated not only for secularism, but equal rights for women, equal rights for LGBT, contraceptive rights, and all those things. So they were very much involved in social action. And that's what I'm talking about, what I will tell you about today. Now, secularism, past, present, and future. Like our context, how we've started to advocate for it, and how we're, we've become activists for it, and some learnings or some things that we've learned along the way that might help you out should you decide to get into this kind of activism. Now, of course, this is our most prominent or most important secular activist. He's Jose Rizal, our national hero. And he said, he who does not know how to look back at where he came from will never get to his destination. Because this is very telling. This is very telling. Where we came from in terms of secularism really says a lot about why we are where we are now and what we should do in order to change that. At first, of course, there was no separation of church and state. What we had was a union of church and state. Instead of having a Philippine constitution, what we had was the Spanish Patronato Real de las Indias, or the Royal Patronage. And it set a deal between how the, the Spanish state dealt with the, the friars in order to run the country. And one of the foremost anti-clerical leaders during that time, Marcelo H. Del Pilar, like, <coughs> outlined all of these ways that the friars controlled every aspect of Filipino life back then. And of course, it led to abuses. Of course, it would lead to abuses. There's no way that could be, could be avoided, especially since they controlled the courts. There were ecclesiastical courts, which were different from civil courts. And in the ecclesiastical courts, the friars always had their say. And one of their decisions, which was to kill the Gomborza, these, these three Filipino priests, led to, it sparked the, the revolution. So Rizal wrote about that, and the Caticoneros took Rizal's word as inspiration. And they fought. They fought against the consequences of being under a theocracy, against the uh, abuses of philocracy. So they were, they were coming to a milestone, really, 
And this is very surprising because when they reached that milestone, they said, let's start our own Congress. We are independent from the Spaniards. And let's start our own Congress, but where do we do it? Let's do it in a church. So they started it, the, their Congress in Baraswain Church, the, the building at the back of the 10 peso bill, if you still have it. So that's it. So, so it's kind of like, it's kind of weird that they did that, right? So, they wrote their constitution, and in the first version of the Philippine constitution, we were a theocracy. Like, the Roman Catholic religion was the state religion. Now, this is not commonly known, because Babini, who was a trusted advisor of Aguinaldo, uh, General Aguinaldo, would not stand for that. So what he did was, he tried to amend the constitution to remove that union of church and state. Okay? And what happened in the voting? It was tied. Okay? And, and wow, Mabini, like, you have to sympathize with the guy. Like, he led the, the, the fight for secularism, and here he was, like, trying to convince a bunch of people to remove, like, that union of church and state. So what did he do? He had another voting. And again, it was tied. So, if I were Mabini, I would be scratching my hair out. So maybe that's why he has that hair. Maybe, like, what the fuck, guys? So, none of this. I'll have none of this. I'll just, like, break the tie by deciding as chairman that there will be separation of church and state. So finally, things were set straight. We finally had a secular constitution. And what was the first order of business for our secular constitution? What was the first thing they did? Okay, 1898, 1899, they didn't expect that the Americans would have the, the war with the Spaniards and then the war with the Filipino revolutionaries. So they said, hey, if we separate church and state, it might divide the people. So let's not do that. So they suspended secularism. That was the first order of business. Now, what does it, this tell us? It's really a bad omen for secularism in the Philippines. And again, uh, fast forward a bit, like the Americans granted us really this freedom, but not in the way that it was done in France. In France, they had laicism. That's very different from secularism. In laicism, you just take what the, what the friars have, take all of their power, and then strip them of their power. In secularism, you, you're a bit more friendly. So what did they do? In exchange for the properties of the Catholic Church, the, the American government paid lots of money. And we know that they have a lot of money because their investments here in the Philippines amount to the billions. More than 18 billion. And that's only what we know of, the publicly registered corporations. We don't know all of their private assets, how much that's amount to. But that's a lot of money. It, like when I did the last calculation, they could buy an SUV for a packed Araneta Coliseum. That's a basketball coliseum. They could give them SUVs and that's gonna be relevant a little later. But they could end starvation for a year if they really wanted to. That's how much money the bishops in the Philippines have. Now, secularism. Where are we now? So this is the definition that stood in every version of our constitution. Of course, you're all familiar with this. This is the general definition. We actually got most of our secularism ideas from the United States, so it's very similar. But the, the ruling religion here in the Philippines, the Catholic Church, has a different idea. They apparently haven't read the Constitution because they have a very different idea. This is what they said, there must be no separation between God and man. The orange bill that elected into law will separate our nation from Almighty God. Now that's such a stark contrast. You can't get any more far from that, that kind of understanding. There must be no separation of church and state. Now that you can understand that because when secularism was first addressed by a pope, he put it in the syllabus of errors. So that's Pope Pius IX, if I'm not mistaken. And he was the first pope to claim infallibility. So they will never change their mind about secularism. 
again, from, from the Constitution, no religious person must participate in politics as a member of a religious organization. Okay, what does the CBCP think? To be noted is the fact that nowhere does the Constitution prohibit clergy and religious from partisan po politics. Again, like the complete opposite. Let's move on. Here's the election code, the omnibus election code, and it clearly states, any head of a religious organization must not coerce in any way, just says, in any manner influence directly or indirectly their parishioners, okay? What does this, the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines think? When a political option is clearly the only one demanded by the gospel, in this case, the church may demand the faithful, even under pain of sin or going to hell. And if that's not coercion, if that's not influencing, I don't know what is. But year in and year out, they get away with this. So it's really very different. Now here, another one. Charitable institutions must not use their tax-free buildings for non-charitable purposes. Okay, but this is, a, this is actually one of the, the first few things that we can charge them with. And I've talked to several lawyers about this, most notably Attorney Raul Pangalangan, who published this in his column, uh, Passion for Reason. And here's, here's how it goes, okay? They, they actually added this clause, this part, actually, directly, and exclusively for a reason. Before, during the last constitution, it wasn't there. Now it's there, and what does that mean? There was a case that in 2004, Lung Center of the Philippines, what happened was, for the Lung Center purposes, that's tax exempt. But they lease a part of their land to another company, and that's clearly commercial. Now, it was brought up to the Supreme Court, the case, because they lost at first, but the final decision was that the part of the lung center that was used for charitable purposes would be tax exempt, and that part that was used for non-charitable or commercial purposes would be taxed, okay? Now, how do we apply that to what's happening in church? In church, when the, the priest tells people who to vote for, that's obviously a political action, right? But how do you separate, like, who he... Who in the church hears that message? How do you separate that? Is it just the pulpit that you tax? Because the entire church is used for a political purpose. Now that's one of the reasons, as well as the omnibus code, that we can use to, to sue the CBCP when the time is right. Right now we're in our infancy, and that's what I'll share with you. Of course the goal is to be like the ACLU or the FFRF in what they do to protect separation of church and state. It's, it's a pity because we copied a lot of things from the United States, but we didn't copy this. They have very clear IRS uh, guidelines about what can and cannot be done by a priest from the pulpit. And it's here. Like you can't make partisan comments in your capacity as a representative of an organization. That's very clear. And when you speak or write, you must make it clear that you're not speaking on behalf of the religious organization that you represent. That's very clear. And a lot of our politicians know that. And one of our politicians thought that he would use this to his advantage. And this politician was Speaker Prospero Nograles in 2008. Now the situation was that the CBCP was asking for the president back then, uh, GMA, to resign, to step down. And what this guy did was he said, maybe we should check taxing the church. Because there are things that I read in the, in the, in the States that said that we should tax them. Okay, but suddenly, both camps kept quiet. This guy never brought it up again, and the church never asked for the president back then to step down. Now it's only in hindsight that we realized the reason because recently, thank you, thank God for WikiLeaks, we discovered that the RH bill was killed by the president in exchange 
for their political support. So there was kind of a trade that went on. The Vatican didn't want the president to step down. The president was afraid that if she went against the church because of her position on the RH bill, then she might lose political capital and eventually be impeached. So there was a trade that happened. And that's what we recognize. And it's very apparent the president is afraid of the Catholic bishops. Now, if the president herself has the most power in this country, of course there should be a balance between the, the departments. But it's actually the executive here that holds the most power. If she's afraid, what more? Separation of church and state right there. That's our <laughs> former president. That's our version of separation of church and state. Okay, if our, it reminds us of this picture. What more the congressmen, right? Now, back then, we were just advocating for secularism online. And aside from our website at the Filipino Free Thinkers, we worked on this project, <coughs> Rational Hero. Again, Jose Rizal is there. If you notice, there's a subliminal message for our age. Of course, you try to hit as many birds as you can. And what we did here was we got people to confess through this website the sins of the church. So we got a lot of submissions, like very common Catholics or non-believers telling people what they found wrong with the church. And of course, we, got, we also reported the violations of secularism there. Now, this project, I didn't do exclusively with the free thinkers. I actually, okay, why did I put that? So these are the, this is what we usually do. This, at first, we were just exclusively holding meetups at coffee shops. We were just holding forums. We were just talking amongst ourselves. Because it wasn't very clear when we started in 2009 whether we wanted to make this public, whether we wanted to go against the established institutions. But we found strength in common allies. Like, you of course know Carlos Eldran, who is a very secular advocate, I'm sure. Um, I'll tell you more about him later. Anna Santos, who's, uh, who made Sex and Sensibilities, an RH uh, education group. And Betang Chioko, of course, of the Democratic Socialist Women of the Philippines, who's also a very prominent leader of the women's rights groups here in our country. So we got together and we talked about how can we take this battle to the streets. We were tired of doing things online. Now, of course, um, Bet was used to her activism already from all of her actions with her women's groups, but the three of us were really new to this. So they weren't atheists, right? They weren't atheists like I was, but they were very secular, and they were secular enough to help me organize an excommunication party. So uh, we also did the excommunication party to promote the RH bill, because back then, Catholics were being threatened with excommunication if they supported the RH bill. So that's what we did to counter that. So again, we got together like one Wednesday and we talked about a plan to have a movement in front of the Catholic bishops' headquarters like on the Friday, right? So, so we, made, we drew up the plans and it was a Thursday and we were making the, the placards for the signs, right? I was at our condo with the other free thinkers who were making the signs, and then I get a phone call. It was Beth, he said, Red, something happened, what? Uh, Carlos is in jail. <laughs> what? Like, how could that happen? Like, we had a plan for, for Friday, and apparently, he got too excited. <laughs> and, and he wore his costume for Friday. He was so excited, he had to wear his costume for Friday, and he, and he was so excited that he had to go into a church, right? Because he thought that would have more impact. Now, what he didn't know was it was actually a, an ecumenical meeting that promoted the Bible with many of the Christian leaders in the front row. So, so he was standing there. He didn't plan this. I, I should explain, probably. Damaso is one of the, the, the arch villain in Jose Rizal's novel. Like, he's a hypocrite and he embodies all of the negative ideas that, sec that theocracy has. So Damaso is that character, and he's kind of saying, you are the modern-day Damaso. 
you priests, you're the modern-day modern day hypocrite friars. So he held this in front of all of these prominent people. And like the, the, the people there, they didn't know what was happening. Like, what is it? Is this because they weren't from the same church? Is this a stunt of the other church? I don't know. But it's not funny. Right? So so Carlos helped clarify a bit. And he, he shouted, like, stop meddling in politics. Like, separation of church and state, um, don't meddle with the government. And now, okay, like the mayor was there, and of course, body, uh, security guards were there, and he was escorted out of the church and into jail. <laughs> okay, he, he got into jail. But of course, it's different. When it happens to a friend with someone you're, you consider an ally, it's different. So this was like the two of us having fun with that sign. This is the trial court. <laughs> where he was going to be uh, given his charges, right? So we were having fun. He didn't really know that he'd have to stay like overnight in jail. And suddenly, we were activists. Suddenly, we were, it, was our, it was our first time leading, because we, we had participated before, but we've never led an actual demonstration. Now, this, this was us and we were, we really had to learn from all of the people around us. And that, that's what we, should remember. Um, there are lots of groups here that have already gone, up, gone against established institutions such as the government and the church. And we should learn what we can from them. That's one takeaway. So we learn to shout chants. We learn the proper way to hold signs. There's a proper way. There's a, there's a scientifically efficient way to do that. Actually, we invented our own signs. So they're, they're illustration boards covered with plastic cover. So they're now lightweight whiteboards. So a lot of our allies have, oh, that's, that's good, that's good. So you could erase it. On the spot, you could adjust your message depending on what they were saying. Now this was... <laughs> so, so that's something we, we, we gave back. Because we learn most of what we know from them, but sometimes we give back. Okay, and it also started our whole brand of doing things, doing the activism. Um, this was us, this is Monsignor Figura, um, the person who came out when we rallied in front of the CBCP. And instead of talking, like, I just stood there and held up this citation needed sign. And that's kind of a, a meme back then. And it was put in the, the front page of the newspaper and then made the headlines. And it was published by the popular blog, Boing Boing. So, so it actually brought attention to what we were doing. And it's important to use humor when you can, because sometimes, like as uh, we were, Mark, Mark taught us a while ago, like there are some people you can't just, you can't talk to anymore. There's no convincing them. So the best way to deal with them not to make fun of them, like to have fun with them in the picture. <laughs> so the Damaso movement started. Like this was the rational hero movement. We made t-shirts and Catholics would now go into churches, like one at a time, wearing the shirts, and they would get these looks from the priest, right? But one time we decided to go back to the scene of the crime, at the cathedral. Wearing a wait. There, there you go. Wearing a bunch of shirts. Now what do you think would happen? Right? What do you think would happen? We weren't allowed in. We were waiting. I, I actually wasn't there, but that guy was there. Like that's, that's him. So we were sitting at the steps of the church because we weren't allowed in. It was supposed to be a discernment mass about the RH bill. They never say that they're against the RH bill. That's what the CDCP does. They bait you and say, we will help you decide. But when you get inside, it's obviously an anti-RH bill mass. So we weren't allowed inside because we would like, discover what they were up to. But of course, we had someone who wasn't wearing the shirt recording what was happening. And one of the things he found out was when the speaker in front asked, like, who among you have read the RH bill? Like, maybe around like, less than 10% raised their hand. Okay, they were all anti-RH, but they haven't even read it. Now, this is one of the things we found out. Anyway, one of the guys came rushing out. 
And he said, why are you here? Why are you here? He talked to the Catholics with us, because we work with Catholics as well, because our main goal, again, is secularism, and we can work with theists for this. And they told the Catholics, oh, first they asked the Catholics, are you a free thinker? No, no, I'm a Catholic. Then you are an oxymoron. Of course, he didn't know the, the use, but anyway, he said, you're an oxymoron. You're not a Catholic, you're a fake Catholic. Okay, and then what did he say to us? Okay, what did, what did he do? He said, Satan, get out! <laughs> With all the emotion that he could muster, he actually tried to exercise us. <laughs> like right there. It wasn't enough to say, uh, this is our event. No, no, no. There's, there's, they want theater. They want drama. So Satan, get out. Like, if I could, or if one of us could, like, turn our heads like that, that would have surprised him. But anyway, we were content to just leave. Because that's one of the lessons that I'll repeat later on. Like, be quiet, be humble. Like, maintain the moral high ground all the time, but have a camera with you. <laughs> yeah, speak softly, but have a small camera. So there. Anyway, as we were leaving, one of the pro-lifers told us, and uh, one of the prominent lawyers who were working with them, you tell your mother to abort you. <laughs> we have a video of this. We don't have enough time to show it, but they... Yeah. The, okay, you tell your mother to abort you, that's not possible anymore. So, he was corrected by this woman, who was a pedant, obviously. You should have told your mother to abort you. It's more correct, but still not possible. But still, still, it, it reveals the hypocrisy. Now, one of the ways to fight for secularism in our country is to reveal how hypocritical they are. Okay, another way is to... Tell people what they're up to. Again, they usually shoot themselves in the foot with what they do. And all you have to do is bring a camera and speak softly. So we went to the medical and legal truths on the RH bill. Is it anti-RH bill from this title? No, no. It's the truth about the RH bill. So we went there. We were, we were wearing our free thinkers shirts. And we talked to them. We had a nice discussion. And we put up their video on our website. Now, she said some crazy things. The people there said some crazy things. There's no such thing as overpopulation. Like, look at the forest. There are no people there. <laughs> okay. And of course, that's, that's very funny, but it borders on really mean. Like he said, you know why the, the recent tragedy in Japan happened? It's, it's because they have an RH bill, because they like contraception. So they say these kinds of things. Now for whatever reason, whether it's for that or for the stupid things that they said, we got this letter. We got this e I got this email. It's a formal demand from one of their members that they will take legal action if we don't take down the video. Oh. Okay? Of course they, they always email in Comic Sans. That's how they <laughs> that's how they do stuff. Right? So any lawyers. Like we were a bunch of young niche volunteers like who didn't have any lawyers but we had allies and again it's very important to have allies. You don't discount them. Like you always remember that they're probably more experienced than you and even if they're not they probably know something more than you do in at least one aspect. So they helped us with legal counsel. Their expert lawyers told us oh Ignore that. Just stand your ground. And they can't do anything. There was a reasonable expectation of publicity for that talk. It, it's you're within your rights to show it. So we held our ground. And this wasn't enough for us. Like, okay, the, the charges were dropped. But we had to do more. And the most popular post on our website to this day is this post, Why the RH Bill is Bad. And it's a satirical post. Like we said things like, there are so many, uh, there's no overpopulation, there's so much space in the bottom of the sea. And, and things like that. And do you want to be extinct like the dinosaur? So that's the kind of language that we used in that post. And still a lot of people were debating about whether we were sincere or not. That's, that's, that's the thing with churches. Like you really don't know when they're kidding or when, when it's an article from The Onion. So, so this post 
it's, it's, it's since received like 100,000 plus views. It has 27,000 plus likes on Facebook. Like that Facebook button doesn't even show anymore if you go to that post because it's just too much. 4,800 comments. To this day, we get, we get messages debunking every point in that article about why that's wrong. So, that's how, so we, we realized satire is successful. Humor is successful and it's very cheap to do. So we kept on, we kept on using it. Yeah. Now, I, I took a stab at it, at satire. So I wrote this post on our site CBCP trademarks the term Catholic. <laughs> now, I said pretty obviously wrong things in that post. I said that they had a commission on franchising and life. Kofal, now, <laughs> now Kofal is a smegma. <laughs> smegma, right? So, so I said, smegma president this and that said this thing. And from that alone, it should have been obvious, right? Right? But here in the Philippines, apparently satire is not that, we're not used to satire. Like we are, like you guys are in other countries. So, it got published in the front page of a tabloid. Right? What? What happened? Okay, there. There, it got published on the front page of a tabloid. And they even interviewed, like, politicians about it. Is it true that? That they trademarked the term, and they interviewed the ex president of the CBCP about it. And, like, the thing is, they didn't dismiss the claims. So, it adds to the, to that, to the effect, right? The effect, satire. So, again, it might seem like you're picking on the Catholic Church. We are, but there's a good reason for that. There's a very good reason for that. Because until very recently, the Catholic Church hierarchy has been the elephant in the room. Like, nobody wants to mention the evils that they do in this country. And one of the first reason, uh, evidence says, one of the, the first things that made me realize that was visiting the HIV summit, right? They were talking about the, the how to handle the growing cases of HIV and AIDS in the country. So it, was, it was apparently growing at a very alarming rate. So we talked about how to deal with that. Now I, I listened to speakers of the caliber that you guys are, like in terms of HIV and, and AIDS, and not one of them mentioned the Catholic Church, right? So I just had to ask, this is my question. How can you address the problem of HIV and AIDS if you can't address the problem of the CBCP? Now, the speakers who were in front, like I got an answer. This was their answer. Oh, that's a tough question. Go to break. <laughs> there was a table filled with representatives from the CBCP, and that's why they can't really mention it. They have to tiptoe around these guys who don't even know about sex. So celibate guys telling people how whether they should use contraceptives or not, or an app that they theoretically do not participate in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that, like from then on, like, wow, that, that guy is actually useful. Like, my allies hate that guy is actually useful. He can say the things that we don't want to say because we have ties with Catholic members and that might be. So that became kind of our role. We say the things that cannot be said. And, and when we talked about ways to promote the RH bill, like we keep on repeating, attack the CBCP, criticize the CBCP. We should pay more attention to them. And finally, they agreed one time, like apparently a lot of people had the same idea, they just needed some extra nudge. They were already in that direction, they just needed an extra nudge. And we had this massive rally um, to, to tell people uh, to tell the bishops about the 11 women who continue to die every day from maternal um, causes, from pregnancy-related causes. Now, we marched. There were, like, a lot of us. Like, look at that. Like, we had the die-in to symbolize all the dead women. That's in front of their headquarters. We clogged that street. There's only one car that could pass that. That's the most, like, militant thing anyone has done 
in recent times against the CBCP. So that became a trend. And we brought this kind of elephant naming to our different movements. Uh, we allied with the LGBT groups. This was the first Pride March we attended. And this, again, I, I started drumming into them. Like the idea that, well, they already knew, but for them, they had different reasons for advocating LGBT rights. For me, it was primarily secularism. Like because um, at first, I wasn't so sympathetic with their causes. Now I am. Now I am truly an advocate of their causes for their cause alone. But back then, I was just, you know, secularist. So I tried to tell them, I had tried to advocate from purely secularist point of view. And this is the, the second Pride March. We had more numbers. Again, we, we were very creative. Uh, what happens in Pride Marches here is that they would march, they would celebrate their identity as LGBT individuals, and then we would get foreigners in the sidelines who are bad-mouthing them, who are criticizing them. God hates fags, that kind of crowd, and it's been growing recently. And what we did was we kept the fundies in check. That was our mission, and for that we received an award, like the best theme. Now it's either that, the, we don't really know what we got the best team award for. It's either keeping the fundies in check or our slogan, which was salt is a sin. So you don't get that. <laughs> salt, anyway. Uh, it's, it's a fun, I like puns. A sin is salt. So it's just a tough, anyway. A tough. Yeah. So third Pride March, again, we, we represented how the Catholic bishops are keeping people in their closets. And those are the closets of dogma, authority, and tradition. And again, we got a lot of pressure, pleasure from doing that. And this is, of course, us celebrating with the first LGBT partilist candidate, right? And we were celebrating because they almost didn't get, get into the running for, for the position. Why? Because of morality. They were initially denied um, a slot because apparently, according to the, to the members of the Commission on Elections, LGBT was immoral. Not only that, it was a threat to the youth. Now why? Because of the Bible, right? Now, hey, that's, that's against secularism. That's not very secular. You use one religion. Aha, no, we also use the Quran. So, so it's supposed to be more secular if they use two instead of one. But of course, that's wrong. That's wrong. And, okay, teaser. Now, one of the things that... And I, I went there. I went into their planning meeting about how they were going to react to this situation of being denied by the Comelec. And some of the arguments were went this way. And this is very characteristic of many of the actions against theocracy in this country. It's actually the Bible is not does not say that that LGBT is immoral. The Bible does not say that so and so and so and so Paul was you no know, Jesus didn't actually mention and all of that and all that do all of those things. And nobody was mentioning the obvious to me that we shouldn't even be talking about the Bible when it comes to government decisions. And even now, it's very hard to convince people to do this. Even one of our champions of the RH Bill, uh, Miriam Santiago, has to argue for progressive theology or liberation theology in Senate. In Senate, she's arguing for the merits of liberation theology. Now, that might be traditional theology, but the, the Senate is no place to do that kind of debate. So, what is this, okay? Um, you saw some of the artwork near the entrance, right? And um, where's Mideo? Mideo. Oh, there he is. Yeah. So what Mideo Cruz did in an exhibit called Kulo that was displayed in the CCP was have this installation art where he put phallic symbols on figures of Jesus. So this is the most, that's an ashtray of a, of a penis that's very popular in the Philippines. You guys should buy it. <laughs> it's a nice gift. 
gets the, the ashes pretty well. Yeah, with a smile even. <laughs> that, that works, they'll, they'll tell you. So anyway, like, of course, the Catholic, the Catholics, the conservative Catholics in the country were in an uproar because of this. It's apparently obscene. Okay? It's immoral. And what, by what standards? Again, by their Bibles. It's blasphemy according to their religion. And what happened here was, again, we tried to raise awareness about it. We, we rallied um, in front of CCP. And this was our Jesus. There was a picture of Jesus actually shaking Medeo's hand. <laughs> that was very nice. Again, humor. And also, we gave Medeo, like, he didn't want to talk to the biased uh, media. So what we did was we invited him to one of our meetups and we got him to explain what he meant by that. So it's, when you hear the explanation of why he did that, it really makes sense. And you should hear it from him. I think there's an article on the site that, that explains that. But without that, it's, it's very easy for Catholics, or angry Catholics, to only see a penis on Jesus' head, which is at the face of it, at the face of it, really all, all that it was. And we also helped them with, uh, with their own like online and offline group, Palayay ng Sining. And it was, this was special for us because while before we were the ones asking help from our allies, now with our experience advocating for RH rights and LGBT rights, we were able to give back to a group that wasn't really used to all the activism. And here we got to give back, so we're very, very proud of that. We also... We also, like I said, we, we work with other groups. We can't work as the Filipino free thinkers alone because a lot of people hate the Catholic Church hierarchy, the CBCP in this country. So we formed this group, Batay Bishop, because of this incident. Okay, you're all, the SUVs. You've heard of this. Have you heard of this? Like it was recently revealed that that some bishops asked for um, SUVs, right? So for sports utility vehicles to be used in their dioceses. And what they did was, um, this, this was supposed to be used for secular purposes, right? But they actually used it just to get around the parish, just to go from church to church. And of course, that's a violation of, of secularism because according to our constitution, to paraphrase, public money should only be, should not be given to religious groups. And according to the PCSO charter, which gave them the money, the funds allocated for charity should be used for health programs, medical services, and charities of national character. So I doubt that when the priests ride the, those SUVs, they actually cure people. <laughs> or maybe they expect them to die and they're, they're just in case. But anyway, they weren't using it for secular purposes. And that was obviously wrong. So again, we took to the streets. Like This was really a flash rally. What we did was we built these SUVs and we went in front of Senate because inside Senate, what was happening was they were being, there was a hearing. Right? There was a hearing about the incident, like what PCSO did and all that. And apparently, it was clarified that they didn't get SUVs. They got money to buy SUVs. So of course, we are very pedantic and we pay attention to, to truth and facts. So we edited that, we changed it into checks. <laughs> so we just want to get our facts straight, facts right. Again, what happened inside that hearing was very indicative of how cowardly they were. Because the senators, instead of grilling them about how they are violating secularism, or rather how the PCSO or government institution was violating secularism, what they did was apologize to the Catholic bishop. I'm so sorry. Your eminence, and they were really frustrating themselves. And the, the the only thing that they didn't do was really kneel down and pray in front of the. But they could, they Afterwards. might as well have done that because that's the kind of behavior that they did. And after that, after they got scot free, they initially I mean, the bishops originally apologized, and because of their treatment, they retracted their apology. There came another case, a retirement home in Tugegarao, a retirement home for priests. That was again funded by the PCSO, by our government. So that was obviously a valid violation, but they weren't called back to the Senate 
again. So that's the state of secularism in our country. And like I said, uh, we got into Congress. Like it was a, it was an honor to speak, to be a resource speaker for Congress. And again, I had a definite assignment. My assignment to us to point out the elephant in the room. And I did that, <laughs> and I was very proud. Right? I said, okay, there should be definite separation of church and state. You know what I, you know the content of what I said. You agree with it? You're the choir. But there was a, a literal choir right after me. The resource speaker of the other side who was against the RH bill sang a religious song. It was a religious song. They let her finish. It was like uh, like three minutes. How long was that? The video. Like yeah, there's a video. Like there's a video on her side. Like two minutes. She was. I, I don't have it here. It was two minutes of her singing. And okay, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. And that's a, that's a situation in inside Congress, right? Of course. It goes both ways. The CBCP obviously has its faults, but it's the fault of our government for, for pandering to them. Technically, there's nothing wrong with what the CBCP is doing because the gatekeepers are our government. So we realized this, and we did the Occupy for our age. We were riding on the whole Occupy movement. And he said, we wouldn't um, get out of here. We will camp in front of Congress until you guys vote on the RH bill. So that's what we did. And by, by this time, I'd already been inside like very secret meetings with other congressmen. And it's really a very d disillusioning to be there. Because I heard them saying things like, why are you doing your action here? You should be doing your action in front of CBCP. Like it's not our responsibility to ensure separation of church and state. And this is a congressman saying this. Yeah. <laughs> like I wanted to stand up and kick him in the face, but again, <laughs> like moral high ground. That's the matter. Moral high ground. We want to keep that. And they said stuff like, you know what? I know a lot of people who would be pro RH, who would be vocal for RH, but the bishops are pestering them every day. If you can get the bishops to keep quiet about the RH bill. Then they will be pro RH and the RH bill will be passed. That's the state of secularism in our country. And these are some of the leaders. And of course, in, a, in my brief talk, I, I won't be able to, to mention all of the things, all of the problems of secularism. There are many. There are, there, there are many. But here are the most notable. Marriage is still controlled by the Catholics. There are concessions of Sharia law to, to minority Muslim in the South, but mostly marriage is controlled by the Catholics. There is no divorce here, there's only annulment, and in the annulment courts, there's always a Catholic priest there, like judging whether somebody's actually psychologically incapacitated. There are a lot of psychologically incapacitated people in the Philippines, because that's the only way you have annulments, really, in the Philippines. Money and craziness. So. Of course, abortion, even within the RH bill movement, we are still split on this. But this is something that we'll eventually have to tackle. It's kind of a, the other A word. The other scarlet A here in the Philippines is actually abortion. And again, we, we all also, all, of course, we have to copy from the, from the states. And our money was perfectly fine. But some people thought, hey, we don't have the in God we trust there. Let's have our own, so we have our own now. That's pinagpala ang bayan na ang Diyos ay ang Panginoon. So that's, uh, blessed is the country where the Lord is God. So we now have a version of In God We Trust. And we're just so busy like tackling all of the other uh, um, issues that I mentioned a while ago that we simply cannot handle them all. And my request is that, that PATAS and other organizations get into this kind of thing. Okay? I mean, it's not enough anymore. Of course, you can add your own purpose to your life. But I tell you, this is a very meaningful purpose. Now, some, like a few things that I've learned. Okay? We obviously can't go the Katipunan route. We can't go be aware of things. Because what they did in Alabang, this small town in South Manila, was that they changed the, the barangay law so that in order to buy contraceptives, you would have to have a prescription. Have you heard of this? Yes. Have you heard, you've heard of this? You'd, you'd have to have 
what kind of prescription would there's something coming out of my <laughs> I need a condom. So that's really the kind of um, stupidity that happened. And they did this like behind the scenes. They didn't tell anyone about it. That's why it's important to be vigilant. Like violations of secularism happen all the time and we should keep our eyes open. Well, thankfully that's been killed. That that whole or barangay ordinance has been killed. Still be alert. Work towards shared goals. Now this is a very sensitive issue for many of us here in the movement. Like, okay, um, I was named a champion of the Reproductive Health Bill. I'm of course very proud of that, but what makes me doubly proud is that this was in conscience, uh, a Catholic, uh, you know, Catholic group in the, the US, uh, the Catholics for Choice, like publishes this, and they recognize me, and they're okay with this. Like when the, the first time that they worked with us, like people were saying, why are you working with these guys? Like I discovered that some of them or most of them are atheists. But we kept working and they recognized that, that we can work together on shared goals. So don't dismiss theists. Um, they're not stupid. They're not stupid. They're, they're actually well-meaning. I, I, I have yet to meet a non-well-meaning theist. Even when they seem bigoted, they're well-meaning based on their own system of morality. That's what you should remember. Everyone's trying their best to be good. And when we can work with others, why not? Be creative. I've already mentioned this. Um, this is our coming out of the closet booth. That It's a literal closet, and they get to come out of the closet again. And when they come out, like a bunch of people like clap for them, and it celebrates like coming out. So that, so again, be creative because we don't have all of the resources of the Catholic Church. We don't have their captive audience. Let's just use what we have. And similarly, fight creatively. Like when we worked with the Green Lantern. Yeah. When we worked with the LGBT groups um, to to fight for like SOGI or sexual orientation and gender identity in the anti-discrimination bill, because of course the Catholic Church wants to remove this, uh, the, the clause that says it's wrong to discriminate based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And the LGBT community wanted to fight against that, but instead of being all mean and shouting and doing the rally thing, we decided to do Christmas carols <laughs> in, in, in front of the CBCP. And we, had, we changed the lyrics of some songs. It was very fun. And, and it's the kind of thing that we should do because, again, it's very easy for them to demonize us. It's very easy. Um, but when you show up and show that you're actually good people, you're actually fun-loving people, it like, pulls the rug from under them. They don't know what to do, how to react to good, to good secularists, to good atheists, and free thinkers. Get your hands dirty, okay? Keyboards, I know, are very, very dirty. Right? There's a study that they did on that. But that does not count. It's not enough today to just stay online behind your computers. You have to get out there. Now, I don't really mean... I don't mean going to rallies like this and participating in bloody demonstrations like that. Like, just get out there. Get out of your comfort zone. Like, do something different again. Get out of your comfort zone, meet people, meet actual people. It's not enough to chat with them through your impersonal, like, white or yellow monitors. It's different. Like, there are a lot of really mean people that are so friendly when you meet them face to face. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah, so, so just, just do away with that whole thing, at least um, for some time, and try meeting people instead of arguing with them. And, uh, a corollary, I guess, is that when you're dealing with people online, imagine that they're right in front of you. If you wouldn't say it, if they were right in front of you, don't. Okay? Educate others. Of course, you, we, we went to schools. Okay, when you do this kind of thing, you will be invited to do a lot of other things. You'll be invited to schools. This was in Miriam College, a Catholic school, and we were here talking about freedom of expression about the whole Mideo Cruz incident. And that's Karen Flores, that's Juana Change and Roddy Vera, who do the Juana, and uh, May Paner and Roddy Vera, who do the Juana Change videos. And 
just be willing to do a lot more work once you decide to do these things. Because there are not a lot of secularism advocates and activists in the country. So when you become one, you'd likely be called on to do other things. Again, I mentioned this already. Keep cool, but carry a camera. This has worked for us like a bunch of times. I couldn't count anymore. Like this first time, we were exercised, right? We were, uh, we were told that our mother should have aborted us. The second time we were in Congress, and the pro-life leader who was next to us like smacked my friend in the face. Okay, we have that. We don't have that on video because as he did that, he hit the camera onto the face of the guy. <laughs> but we have him on video hiding when we tried to interrogate him about the incident. So again, atheists, how do they behave inside Congress? They are behave. Pro-life people, they hit people in the face. <laughs> yes. So it's just as simple as that. Just again, bring awareness to what's actually happening instead of the stereotypes. Break the stereotypes. Use social media. They, are, they have their captive audience, they have their Sunday and anticipated Saturday mass audience, they have the schools, but we have social media. They don't know how to use it. <laughs> I don't think they know how to use it. We are much better at it. Like a free, free thinkers, even free thinkers, patas, and all the other secular orgs has a lot of, of uh, is where it is now because of social media. And we were fortunate enough to be named uh, the most influential online group in the country by uh, by the wow. recent group that I was. So that says a lot. That, that says a lot. And so there's space. Like people actually sympathize with what we do. They're just not so vocal about it. The first step is online. Convince them online and it will be so much easier to convince them when you're talking face to face. So use social media. It's free. It's easy to learn. There are many people who you can learn from. It's fun. Spread the news. Again, this, this is one of the things you'll be called to do. You'll be called to speak about it. We've, we've spoke, spoken about it in the radio, in the TV, in magazines. Say yes to everything. Even the smallest requests for interview, interviews, say yes to that. I'm sure you, Patas, as it grows, will be ask more and more for some of these things, say yes to that. You'll never know when a connection will pay off. So again, be willing to do more. <laughs> Support champions. There are, the secular individual in the Philippines is rare. So when the, they arise, like support the hell out of them. Like this is, of course, Pia Cayetano. And she got, like we've been in Congress and in Senate countless times listening to senators and congressmen say that, but God did not say that. The Bible didn't say that. You will lead the Philippines to that nation. <laughs> and then you hear someone saying that if there were only one non-Catholic person in this country, she would fight for their right to choose. And similarly, if there's only one Catholic person in this country, she would similarly defend her right to choose, uh, that person's right to choose. So when you have people like this, who understand where we're coming from, support them. We gave her an award recently. Uh, we had an RSS forum, April 1, and she got the Secularism Award. Similarly, bash bigots. We had the RSS Awards, and we had the Bigot of the Year Awards. And this made news. Again, humor makes news. So, Senator Soto, I, I, I was telling Tanya about this, and I think she likes the idea. What we did was, we, we found the biggest bigot, and the prize for him was we would donate in his name a donation, a substantial donation, to the organization he hates the most. <laughs> and in that case, it's the Reproductive Health Advocacy Network. So we gave them, we gave them the prize. So safeguard science, safeguard science. There's um, secularism is supported by science, so be vigilant again when pseudoscience or superstition arises, try to counter that. And I'm also a volunteer for the James Randi Educational Foundation. So if you see people like, yeah, making claims, like, like Jaime Licauco, like those faith healers, like tell them that, talk to me, the JREF will give, give them a million dollars if they can prove that they can actually do what they want. And what usually happens in the history of JREF 
is that they don't take the challenge because they don't want to be proven as charlatans. So anyway, safeguard science. Don't be a dick. <laughs> this, this lays around in the US. There was a big debate about militant atheism, which I think is coming up next. I don't think militant atheism necessarily entails being a dick. But admit it, we sometimes are dicks to other people, especially to theists, and especially when we're new. We just have to get it out of our system. We've been fooled for so long. We have to blame someone. We have to debate with someone. We have to convince someone. And it just doesn't work, as Mark told us a while ago. So don't be a dick. Um, there are many kinds of personalities, as was mentioned a while ago. But at least try to be friendly. Try to be friendly. Like, when you're not, you shut down the lines of communication, and everything that you do is counterproductive. And I mention this because that was the kind of personality that I, that I projected when I talked to, to Boya Bunda and effectively to many people who were meeting an atheist for the first time. And it broke the stereotype of the angry atheist. Of course, you can be an angry atheist. But what I'm saying is, like, don't be a dick. But there's a caveat to this. Like, the expectations of us are so low that you just say that you're an atheist and automatically people will have a higher esteem for atheists. I guarantee you this. Anyone you say you reveal the fact that you're an atheist too, like you enhance the image of atheists. It's so low here, uh, the reputation of atheists, that just by saying that you're their friend and you're an atheist does a lot of good things. Lastly, find friends. Now, of course, that's, the, that's one of the reasons that we form groups such as this. We form free thinkers, we form patterns, and all the other groups. Because we need friends. This is a lonely battle. We might not even win in our lifetime. But what makes that fulfilling is when you do it with friends. You won't last in this if you don't form friendships. And that's what you should, should do. Because at the end of the day, even if you, you've left religion, you still need that sense of community. And you don't need churches for that. What you need is just friends. So form, find friends. And I've met a lot of friends here today. I wish that we can work together and be even more friendlier in the future. And I hope you can join us in the fight for secularism in this country. We need all the help we can get. Um, on June um, 2012, we're having a secularism summit where we'll invite all of the allies in all of our movements to form a coalition that will become the body that fights for secularism in this country and that will hopefully do what the ACLU and the FFRF do in the United States. So we hope to get your support for that. Um, we'll give you more details. But again, let, uh, thank you so much and let's keep this fight going. Thank you. <laughs>